Now, if you know me or if you've been following the channel, you know that I absolutely love home theater and I have been in the pursuit of building what I consider the perfect or best home theater speaker that you can build or buy. And I came across these. These are the JTR 212s and these things look amazing and they really tick off all the boxes that I want. But there's only one issue. They're $14,000 for a pair of them. Well, at least MSRP. I guess if you buy them directly from the manufacturer, they're only $7,000 for a pair. But that's significantly more than I want to spend on my new home theater that I'm starting to build upstairs. And I think it's more than a lot of people want to spend. And that's why I decided to design these. These are the Audience 212, and these monstrosities are exactly what I've been trying to build for a while now. Now, whenever you're trying to build a high quality speaker like this, you want to use high quality components. And I got to say, picking out the components was a meticulous decision. And I decided to go with a brand that some of you may not be familiar with, SB Audience. Now, SB Audience, you may not know of, but you're probably familiar with SB Acoustics, which is a high-end brand for hi-fi speaker components. SB Audience is the offshoot of SB Acoustics for their pro version of their models, and they really care about the quality that they put out and, well, the quality that you're receiving. And so I decided to use these drivers. I wanted to use the best of the best. And so I picked out their best 12-inch woofer, which is this Neo version, their best one inch compression driver, which matched out really well with the horn. When I started designing this, one of the things that really surprised me, this came out to be the exact same size as the JTR212. It was 58 inches tall, 14 inches wide, by 16 and a half inches deep. Now some of that was due to the double front baffle that I chose to use, but I'm gonna share a little bit more about why I chose that in just a minute. Now in order to cut these out, I needed to cut out two holes for the 12 inches. I decided to use like an MTM configuration with the horn in the middle, which worked out really good for this build. Now I did use the CNC and honestly, I, I wish I wouldn't have. I wish I would have just used a router and a table saw. I mean, I used, I cut out all the wood with a table saw. So why did I use the CNC to cut out the circles and well, really some straight lines for the horn? Well, honestly, I, I overcomplicated it. For the CNC, I had to put up jigs to make sure I was cutting correctly, and then I had to flip it around to cut out the port. And honestly, I think you'd be better off just using a circle jig and a router with a template bit. And I think you would have been much better off than well, what I did with the CNC. And that's kind of the cool thing about this build is it doesn't really take any special tools. The only thing I really did use the CNC for was for the braces, and honestly, it was, well, unnecessary for that. The one thing you will notice about the braces is they're asymmetrical, meaning the left hand side looks different than the right hand side. And there's a reason for that that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the video. I decided to glue out the box. You could glue out the box, I guess, all at the same time if you really had enough clamps. I, I definitely did not have enough clamps. So I just went ahead and glued up the box like normal and then decided to glue up the braces. Now, the braces need to go in a certain spot so that they don't get in the way of the woofer or of course the compression driver. So I measured that out and I like to use a square or speed square if I have one on hand to make sure everything's going up and down. Uh, that way I get the best surface area to glue uh, when I'm doing this. I'm gonna uh, of course clamp this both on the top and the bottom of this brace when I get this in. Now I'm gonna put three braces in. One thing that you're gonna notice is that the three braces are not all situated the same direction. In fact, uh, they're alternating every other direction. And the reason why we do this is to get better sound quality. The reason why I do this is to make sure that the cabinet doesn't have a weak side versus a strong side. I wanna kinda of offset that strength so that we don't get any panels resonating. Now, whether this actually benefits or not, I've never tested, it's just something I like to do. In addition to that, that's not the only bracing I did. I also wanted to connect those sides with the top. So I cut some MDF and one and a half inch strips and well, just cut them down to size and glued them in. Now you don't want these to be extremely loose. You want these to be, well, pounded in gently into place. If they're real loose, they're not gonna be doing any good anyway. And if they're too tight, they're gonna break your braces. So you want them to be, well, 
just right. The one thing to keep in mind is that you don't want these too high up in the enclosure. If you make them too high, you won't be able to put your woofer down in there. So you want to measure that off to make sure that uh, they're not going to be an issue. For me, it was about eight inches and that worked out perfect for me. Except the compression driver, that was a little bit further down. Luckily, SB Audience has some great technical drawings that show you exactly how far down that things would need to be. And don't worry, in the plans, if you check the description for those, those will actually tell you the exact spot that you want to place those. Now that's not the last thing that we want to do to get good sound quality. We're going to do what we call a double front baffle. Now by doing a double front baffle, we really deaden this enclosure, or at least hope to deaden this enclosure, which is of course one of the main reasons why you do a double front baffle. In this case, there's actually two reasons. One is of course to deaden the enclosure like we just talked about, but the other is, well, honestly, after I recessed those woofers in it, I didn't have enough room for the screws to bite down in, and so I really needed that extra three quarter inch to be able to really have those screws bite down into something. So we're already adding quite a few things to get the sound quality to where it needs to be, but that's still not the end. But before we talk about that, we're gonna go ahead and finish this enclosure. Now, I'm gonna have to sand this and sand it quite a bit. When I sand something like this, I wanna sand it with a really rough grit sandpaper, something like a 60 or 80 grit sandpaper. One of the things that you'll find out when you're finishing speakers is that where that MDF meets, sometimes the glue doesn't squeeze all the way to the very edge and you get some areas where you can put your fingernail in. Now this isn't a hole in the enclosure, but it is something that's going to be seen if you paint it. Now this is one of the tricks that I've learned recently that I really like doing. I just pour a little bit of wood glue on that seam and let it start to dry. Once it starts getting a little tacky, I'm gonna go ahead and hit it with my sandpaper again, and that sawdust will mix with the MDF dust and it'll fill that gap up. The only bad side to this is, well, your sandpaper is, well, no longer able to be used. So make sure you do all of that at once if you can. You'll probably go through a couple sheets of sandpaper though. Now that all of my prep work is ready to be painted, I can go ahead and paint this sucker. Now for this, I wanted to make sure that the look looked very similar to like a JTR. And although I'm not quite sure exactly what they use, I do believe that they use Duratex. Now I decided to use Exohide, which is a version of Duratex, or it's a competing brand at least. And what Duratex or Exohide is, is it's almost like a bed liner for speaker cabinet. In order to apply this correctly, you're gonna use a special roller that you buy. Now the Exohide I bought was a little bit cheaper than the Duratex brand, so I wanted to try it out. And I gotta say, I was very impressed with the Exohide. I got a gallon of this stuff and I was able to paint both speakers and still have plenty left over. In fact, I didn't even use a quarter of a gallon of this stuff. It's just amazing how far this goes. I did about two coats on each one of these speakers. So that should give you a good idea of how far this stuff can go. All right, now that everything is painted, I have one last thing that I'm gonna do for the sound quality, and that's adding some dampening material into the enclosure. Now you can use all kinds of different types of dampening material. I just decided to use uh, an old mattress pad, but really use the type that you are most comfortable with. Uh, all these, all I did with these is just cut the mattress pad out and spray it with some of this 3M77 glue. I'm gonna go ahead and link that in the description. It's one of the better products that I've used with this. Uh, the biggest thing is going around those bracing that we put in there. You might have to cut some reliefs inside the mattress pad in order to get it in there. Now, the mattress pad that I used was a queen size and it actually worked for both speakers, although uh, king size would have been a little bit nicer to have. Now I'm gonna line this entire cabinet except anywhere near the port. That I'm just gonna go ahead and leave undone. Now that these are finished, I brought these up to my theater room and I gotta say, these things are huge. I did not, I don't know. I mean, you think 58 inches, you're like, okay, 58 inches. But when you start standing next to these, you realize how big these speakers are. The speakers are too big, I'm not too small. I swear, I mean, I'm not tall like Shaquille O'Neal, but I'm also not short like Tom Cruise or Danny DeVito. I'm just normal height. And I felt kind of small standing right next to these speakers. And the great thing about these is these are actually very sensitive. But I still got to design the crossover. And this is where you can take good drivers and either ruin them or make them sound like gold. So let's go ahead and take a look at this crossover. Now I took all my measurements with my Dayton Omni mic and I started 
designing the crossover. The first thing I did is work on the woofer, and the woofer I was trying to get away with the second order, but honestly, the third order really made a big difference. I, so I actually did a third order on the pair of woofers, which is atypical for me. Now the woofers are wired in parallel, meaning that they go from an 8 ohm load to a 4 ohm load. So this speaker is considered a nominal 4 ohm load. Having said that, it's a very easy nominal 4 ohm load to push. Uh, I, I've run this with just my surround sound receiver pushing it and I have no issues with it at all. Now I also needed to go ahead and work on the compression driver and the compression driver once again wasn't too bad. I did a third order on the compression driver which I knew I was going to anyway and these crossed over right around 1.3 kilohertz and it was really a perfect crossover point. I couldn't have been happier. Your distortion was low and it just got a very good off-axis response. So now I need to fire these things up. Now because we ran these woofers in parallel, I didn't even have to attenuate the tweeter that much. Uh, this thing is a very sensitive speaker. You don't need much power to power these. When I did power these in room, something kind of interesting and exciting happened. If you take a look at the non-EQ'd response, you're gonna see that I get in room response all the way down to 40 Hertz usable. And that's pretty exciting. Now, after doing a little bit of EQ work, I got these to go flat down to 35 hertz. Now, what's even more interesting is that when I hooked these up to my surround sound receiver, it auto EQ'd that for me with its room EQ wizard, so I didn't have to manually adjust it. And its crossover point was 40 hertz. That makes these pretty much full range tower speakers to go as your front sound stage. This makes a huge difference, especially as a center channel because you get the full range of sound for those voices. And I gotta say, I have really enjoyed this. Now I'd like to hook up speakers like this as a center channel and run them for a long time to be able to see what type of clarity we get. And this has been by far the cleanest and clearest speaker that I have designed. Now, in the beginning, I wanted to design something that was inspired by that JTR speaker. And the question that I always have at the end is, did I meet those expectations? And honestly, I don't feel like I met those expectations. I felt like I exceeded those expectations. I was really impressed and I didn't expect these to sound as good as they did. In fact, there were some times where I was concerned about how good it might sound, but I, but I gotta say, I'm very, very impressed with these. There's only one problem with these speakers. I only have two of them, meaning I can't just go without building a center channel after hearing this as a center for so long. It would be a crime to have these just as the front two towers. So since I'm running an acoustically transparent screen, you know I'm gonna run a third one behind there. Now, I just gotta go buy all the parts to build a third one. All right guys, now this has been the Audience 212 build. If this is your first time at the channel and you like building speakers or seeing how they're designed, make sure to hit that subscribe button and make sure to hit that bell so you get instant notification whenever I put a video out. Now, if you really wanna support the channel, make sure to hit that like button. It really does help us out. Also, you could consider being one of my patrons like these guys here. They really help me out and I really appreciate everything they do for me. All right guys, this is Toyd's Audio. And I'm out.